in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was light. If we didn't have light, we'd have no atmosphere. We only developed our atmosphere through photochemistry, really, of the initial degassing of prim primordial Earth. Um, and that gave rise, with, uh, and that's why maybe I got interested in photochemistry uh, very early on, because it was the, the, really the centre of, of everything, and it, it produced our, our atmosphere itself. So the atmosphere is something that I moved to after I'd done photochemistry. It was just a logical progression to go to the atmosphere. And of course, if there's no atmosphere, there wouldn't be any plants, and there wouldn't be any us. There wouldn't be that synergy between uh, carbon dioxide being taken up and being breathed out in, in, in respiration. Probably more important for this lecture, although of course we're important, so are plants, is that if we didn't have sunlight, we wouldn't have any climate. So before we talk about climate change, we've got to work out what climate is. And there you can see a rotating off-axis Earth that gets hit by the sun, but because it's off-axis, it's not equal intensity. In the equator, it gets more, it's more in intensely uh, 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 dispersed, and when it gets to the poles, it's weaker. So you've already set up some sort of thermal gradient between the middle and the top. Now, I guess you didn't expect to have any true first-year physical chemistry here, but there is with the PV equals NRT. Because what happens when, when the sun hits, let's say, a particular cell of air that's, that's in, in, the, in, in the planet's atmosphere, um, it, it warms it up because of the heat. And of course, because of PV equals NRT, I mean, warm air rises. So you've got warm air going up, and then you rotate the Earth a bit, and then you've got cooler air underneath. So again, you've set up this imbalance between hot and cold, and you've got uh, high pressure and low pressure, therefore. And what you develop is a wind, and a wind is important. It's not the only thing that's important to give uh, the, the climate, but it's important when it interacts, say, with the oceans, where it pushes things up into the air, you get different temperatures because of it, but you certainly get uh, things move, moving around. So the light, once again, is the key to us having a climate at all. So let's move on then to the sorts of measurements that you, we, we get, that we're all familiar with, um, uh, uh, you know, to, to do with our, our weather and climate, which is the, the winds, as I've said, uh, the, the rain because of uh, the, the, the temperature that there may be in the planet and because it's gone over, over the oceans to lift things uh, up into the air, the so sunshine visibility in cloud. And then when I say, well, that's pretty much the same as climate, it is and it isn't, because it's always confusing to people as what's the difference between weather and climate. And it's fairly easy. I mean, it's, it's short term and long term, really. And if you want to think of it in a human terms, then weather is your mood. You can be angry, you can be happy, you can be sad. And it may change from minute to minute or day to day. Climate is the personality of the person. So if you get to know someone over 30 years, then you say, oh, that, he's got a sunny disposition or, or, or whatever. But, um, and, and that's why it's different. It, it's just an addition of all of those things that on, on the whole tell you the trend of what that person is like. And that's the difference between weather and climate. So there'd be no lecture if we didn't have any climate and we didn't have any change. And I've said how important winds are. Um, it, what the winds are is, is moving that, transferring that heat around the planet because you've got that imbalance between the equator and with the poles. Um, and uh, that's done by, by the winds that, that we have. But not only do winds sort of transfer that, the, the warmth around, um, it also transfers pollutants around in the fluid that's our atmosphere and it takes maybe one to two years for pollutants that may be released um, in, the, in the northern hemisphere to get round to the, the, the southern and, and, and vice versa. So all of these things are important to the story that I'm going to tell soon enough 
about climate change. Where to begin? Well, it's the air that we breathe. Um, if any of you have done uh, any of the fourth year atmospheric chemistry, you'll know that uh, we divide our atmosphere into layers. Those layers are really to do with temperature profiles, but it's ir irrelevant here really. We just have an atmosphere, let's say. And how we got that was really through sunshine again, to do with a process of photosynthesis that was originally due to cyanobacteria, but then has moved on to plants, where you ought to know that the way that plants get energy, their carbohydrates, and breathe out oxygen, is because they've got carbon dioxide and water coming in. So if it was only oxygen coming out and carbon dioxide going in, and that was our atmosphere, it would be really simple, and that's almost the end of, of the lecture. But it's not, as you all know. Nature creates pollution, OK? Um, when you get lightning storms, it cracks the nitrogen and the oxygen that are in the atmosphere, makes nit nitric oxides of, of one type or another. Um, when, you, when you have, uh, and I think that's a volcano there that, that's sort of going a bit crazy on, on, on my side, but there's a volcano that throws out uh, sulfur gases, sulfuric gases of some sort. And then as well, if you look on the, on the bottom left, there, there is this dust, it's just dust that gets blown around and is, is, is also an important pollutant, particularly if the dust is very small. Nature doesn't just throw out um, those types of phenomena. I mean, there, there are real, and you could sometimes call them uh, pollutants, they're biological warfare agents in some ways. Um, and, and what I've got here is that, I mean, you all know well, pollen and fungal spores, um, they have certain sizes. That they, you know, these are bigger pollen and these are smaller. And I've got them flashing on and off just for a little advert uh, about me. Um, and, and that is because uh, a lot of the research I've been doing over the last couple of years has been trying to look at the fluorescence of these biological materials and detecting them by the fluorescence itself. Um, what we've been looking at, I've got a roll of honour of those who have been uh, unfortunate enough or fortunate enough to work with me uh, below on this, on this, on this project. Um, and what we've been looking at are these biologicals that come from composting sites, things that are in hospitals, it's something we're just moving into, um, agriculture and the pollen count. But this is all another lecture, and if you want me back, I'll come and give you a lecture about that. Um, but it's not really just nature that gives us pollution. It, the, the, the real beasts, so that this thing, now that we've moved into something called the Anthropocene, it's to do with, with humans' effect on, on uh, our atmosphere and, and pollution. Um, the, the, the first collection I've got here is transport. You can see from the, from the pictures here, you hear about diesel probably every day. Um, you also uh, know more, although it's uh, a taboo subject in Ireland, to talk very much about the problems of air pollution that comes from agriculture. And it probably is about the biggest pollutant that there is of one type or another. But here we have um, what happens when you produce ammonia in some way. This is rather a, a nice pig uh, who's, uh, who's clearly been house trained to uh, do potty. Uh, and um, he gets rid of his ammonia that way. Fertilizers, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, uh, are, are problems, the nitrogen in particular, that can get up in the end into the atmosphere. And of course, these things called eructations, which are cows burping and also doing the same, but from the other end, um, that, that, that give rise to methane. So uh, we know more and more about what's happening there, and we're trying to think of ways to, to, to reduce uh, those outputs. And then finally, I'm going to have a few brief words about this too, because it's something we've been looking at in the crack lab, is, is the pollution that's caused by solid fuel. And here, be much more interested in, in um, the, the particulate matter that I was talking about earlier. 
So what are the most abundant ones? Well, you can read off for yourself all these gases, you know there, and they, they have two, two major concerns for us. One is this thing called health and wellness, and the other is to do with climate change. And I'll be sort of talking about both during the rest of this talk. So, I mean, obviously, you know, climate change and carbon dioxide, read it, read it, read it, and that's, they're involved in that. But the key, the linking ingredient, are these solid particles that very often are visible, and we call them soot, or invisible, and we call them PM then, particulate matter, PM10, PM2.5, and PM1, because they have direct health effects, and they also have effects on climate change, because if they're black, they act like a greenhouse material. So we're understanding more and more these days that there is no point, you can't, you shouldn't, separate climate change and air pollution. They go hand in hand. So, why do we need to, to, to look at the air? Well, I, I mean, I've, I've picked my two topics, health and wellness and climate change. Uh, several of these you'll know, the Asthma Society of Ireland, any of you that may have asthma might realise how important air pollution is to your condition. Um, even just getting headaches or red eye, um, but and far worse sometimes with cardio and, and, and respiratory uh, problems are caused very often by air pollution. A bit more about that later on. And regards climate change, uh, we know you can't help but read virtually every day about these so-called extreme weather events, flooding there, there, there's been recently in the last couple of years uh, in Ireland itself, uh, getting drought and desertification, and of course the Arctic and polar ice cap melting that there is. So that's why our air needs care. Now I, I said that the health issues and the uh, climate change issues are intimately connected. Um, here is a cartoon that talks about petrol cars and diesel cars and they have complementary but different effects. One makes high carbon dioxide, straight away you think climate change. The other one gives you higher nitrogen oxides and straight away you think of air pollution and health. So that connection up and down, uh, and really in, in, in Ireland and the same with uh, much of the world, we um, sort of give diesel a bit of a premium because it's a better uh, climate change gas. Um, but, of course, it has worse health effects. And so that type of problem has got to be taken into account in, in the future. In the end, a bit like my good self, you've got to go over to the fully electric car like the, the new Tesla. Climate change uh, has happened. Um, whenever the wonderful Danny Healy Ray says uh, climate change has always been with us, he's quite right. I mean, 700 million years ago, it was snowball earth, or at least the slushy, a bit like a frozen cocktail or something. And then climate change has happened, and we now get to really what is the, the blue planet, the sort of David Attenborough uh, uh, place. But that was all due to the initial pushing of that degassing, if you remember, of planet Earth um, to release carbon dioxide in the first place, which then allowed, because the, the ice was then, it, it was solid, but then needed to warm up to give some vapour, in, in order to produce an atmosphere that had both carbon dioxide and water vapour into it, and then things could really start to happen. You began to get some warmth in the um, in, in the uh, in, in our planet. More recently, though, we've been worried not about that 700 million year change, climate change, but of what's been happening over the last 20 years or so. And in this graph, what you can see, I'm, I'm going to have a number of graphs that look like this, really, um, is that you'll see all this red end is all to do with 
um, the 1990s to the 2010s and you can see all of the warm years there's a baseline that's taken as about 1961 and when it's uh, generally speaking when it's colder it's when it's earlier on that is almost down to the pre-industrial revolution times and when it's warmer above the, the, the anomalous uh, temperature than it's in these last 10, 20 years. We see lots more. This is a fairly old slide, but it just does show well, I think, that the climate is changing and changing a bit faster than we will like. We make measurements, and we make measurements in the air, and we make measurements on, on the land. And what you can see here is that they, they, they track each other fairly well, and there's been this gradual uh, increase, but actually is now accelerating a bit uh, over, the, over the years. And then you say, well, so what? Well, here's one, so what? Um, and it's been perhaps happening uh, in, on, on the planet in the last five years or so, is that one of the outcomes of climate change is drought. Uh, you get different warming areas. What that can lead to is sometimes it's called food security but actually it's food insecurity of not being able to grow sufficient crops in order to feed your population and so you get famine and famine generally speaking leads to war the haves and the haves nots so when we get that how many is Ireland I'm Mark Fischetti and this is a special report from Scientific American on the role of climate change in the Syrian refugee crisis in 2015, millions of refugees fled their homes in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Hundreds of thousands headed for Europe. Many of them crowded onto inadequate rafts, arrive here in Lesbos, Greece. I'm going to um, just finish there with that particular video, because all I will say is that I believe Ireland took 90 of those uh, refugees, um, and there's going to be more, more than 90 for sure. I mean, that there are varying estimates of how many climate change refugees there will be in 20 years if we don't do something properly, but it could be tens of millions. So Ireland, Kerry, look out for a million coming in. More than 90. And then today, President Trump, um, who even in my graph here, has limited understanding about climate change. He's, I put him at one out of a hundred on my arbitrary sodo scale of knowledge, uh, much in the same way that he does arbitrary uh, uh, statements. And, and here it is, I mean, uh, BS, yes, he's tired of hearing this nonsense. Um, and then, of course, it was all to do with the Chinese who did this anyway. So, not, not great, but of course this is man is now president of the free world, most important man that there is around, other than one, of course. We do have one who's more important. He has said to Emmanuel, I think you will have to change, because I don't, I don't agree with our story about climate change at all. And uh, there have been patterns of climate change going back over the years, before that indeed there was ever a combustible engine working and put in, play in, in, in this country or in any other country. Because if we go back to the living and the 12th centuries, the, this country was uh, roasted out of it. And <laughs> <laughs> in the 15th and the 16th centuries, we were thrown out of it. In the 1740s, we had a famine that we lost over 3 million people because of two years of bad weather. The records were proved that uh, aim and right. And I say to you, uh, we lost three, over three million at that time. We didn't have any combustible engine or anything like it uh, at that time. And you are talking about cattle and suckler cows. There were, there were a fraction of the cows in Ireland at that time. That's the, that's the, that's the, no. And what I'm saying to you is... A fine mind there at the work. <laughs> Um, and of course, after what's happened today, I mean, obviously, this man is going to be the next Taoiseach. Yeah. <laughs> Roasted and drowned out of it. There, 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 uh, there won't be a comment. Actually, one of the little things that he said get about that 1740 famine, we'll have a look at that a bit later. 
Where does it all begin? Where does this accelerated effect begin? Well, it begins with the atmosphere. I've mentioned those, those layers, not important here, but I mean, it does have functions, two important functions really. It, it keeps us warm, and I think of it as a, a sort of a, a holy bl blanket that's, that's around the planet. And it, of course, acts as a suntan lotion to keep out uh, UV, B and C, and most of A as well. Um, and that atmosphere is a, a, a chemical reactor, really. It consists of things that I guess probably, um, even at school, you, you always knew that there was 78% of, of nitrogen in there and 21% of oxygen. Um, that really is the absolute bulk. But more and more, we understood after, I mean, those early years of I mean, Gay Lussac, who was making these. Uh, analytical chemistry in the atmosphere is that it's the trace materials that are important. Uh, not so much the, 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 the argon, which is less than a percent, but you can see you've even now got very close to 100% leaving everything else that there is to contribute. Um, this was taken in 2005 and there was 0.035% of carbon dioxide at the time. Uh, I looked a couple of weeks ago and in 2000 we are now at 0.04% uh, uh, of um, carbon dioxide and the units that we use are, are, are called parts per million uh, parts per billion or parts per trillion this is parts per, per million as, as a, a, a ratio um, so it, certainly this ingredient as you might expect has, has gone up gone up fairly dramatically so we allow the, the light to come through and then these ingredients like carbon dioxide will trap things. But one of the important other ingredients that there are is water vapour itself. This is a key greenhouse material that we have in, in the atmosphere. And it cycles the, the water between liquid and solid, you know, and, in, and, into, the, um, and into the atmosphere. And the moon, as you know, doesn't have an atmosphere. And so without our atmosphere, we'd actually be about the same temperature as the moon, which is minus 18 degrees centigrade. So we wouldn't really uh, be around. I mean, nothing would have had a kickstart. So the atmosphere is the key beyond the sun to, to us living. So here's how it happens. So it's the, you've seen this diagram, I guess, a hundred times. Uh, in, in, uh, in, in newspapers and, and, and magazines now, of we, we really do think of the sun allowing light to go through the greenhouse and bounces back and gets trapped. And that's just like the atmosphere, it goes through there. And where we've reached now is, is uh, the, the Goldilocks temperature, as it's called. Not too hot, not too cold, it's just right. Um, and that's where we thought we were. And certainly up until the Industrial Revolution, we probably were. Um, even without what's happening more recently, the greenhouse effect, in more scientific terms, uh, occurs because of infrared radiation being trapped by ingredients that can absorb infrared radiation in the atmosphere. So here's carbon dioxide wiggling around, and here's methane. Uh, n now, which, which actually is much more effective at doing it. I mean, one very simple way of looking at it, it's got more bonds, so it, it, it's able to do, to do more. So we, we have to be uh, slightly afraid of some of these other materials that we're releasing to augment the effect of carbon dioxide. And it's not just them, particles of black carbon soot, as I said earlier, also may uh, uh, cause damage. A lot of you might be um, surprised to know that the carbon dioxide effect that we so much attention is paid to this day was um, looked at in 1896 by Arrhenius of the kinetics equation and he predicted at the time that for a doubling of the carbon dioxide that was in the atmosphere uh, really it, it'd go up about five to six degrees and then many billions of dollars later in the last few years that have been spent We've found that actually he's not that far off. It may be about four degrees or five degrees, but it's there or thereabouts. 1896 is when that was predicted. So, where we're at now is not just that natural greenhouse effect. It's because we have an enhanced greenhouse effect. 
where we had that blanket that keeps us warm that's that's quite thin wall with holes in and what we're beginning to do is to replace it and make it thicker with wool here or carbon dioxide and filling in those holes those resonances that the the, the carbon dioxide can't so those holes are, are filled by things like methane and chlorofluorocarbons ozone and nitrous oxide so we're getting warmer and warmer because we're filling in more of the holes and making the woolen shawl even thicker. Now just a word about methane because th this shows one of the reasons why it's quite difficult to, to calculate what's really going on. Methane is lots from microbial sources like these rice paddy fields and, and, and as I said earlier from, from cattle and we know that it's going up in, 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 uh, in uh, concentration but the key is this is that when you have these rice paddies then and we have climate change happening which it is beginning to happen as one of the functions will be to get more rain if you get more rain you get more wetlands and then you get more methane so you have this feedback feed into the system where you've got some material coming and then you're going to make a lot more because of of climate change itself happening the, the sensitivity uh, which is which is more difficult to, to calculate than just the straight physical models. It all began in 1830 when we started to want energy. It started with 280 parts per million, and now whoomph, it's going up since about 1960. So we we, we have a, a lot of data from a, a long while ago. One of the most important data sets is from Hawaii, um, from Mauna Loa, where there have been monitoring the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for about 50 or 60 years now. I just look at that table here and what you can see it's in decades since 60 and you see that well just recently probably about two parts per million increase per decade on average. Last year it went up by 4.5 parts per million. <coughs> So a double doubling that's happened over 20 years is at 400 parts per, per million at the, uh, at, at the black line. And what this, this graph does show, if it goes all the way this time, is that the, um, the level that's been reached now will always be 400 parts per million and above. We've, we've reached the point of no return of, of, of getting 400 parts per million. Let's see it carry on now and then we'll see that during this year here we are. Right, so we're here where it would never go because remember there, there is a balance between photosynthesis happening and then decay of, of the vegetation to, to bring carbon dioxide in and releasing carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. I'm going to look this time now at the temperature graph and what we see is that as we're going up over the years, um, we haven't reached the 1.5 or 2 degrees centigrade. It's going up in a way quite regularly over the years until we get to this last year. And suddenly there's this big leap just in the year that we get a big leap. Uh, and here's where my piano playing comes in. So there's no question that the Arctic sea ice volume has been going down over the last 20 years and it looks like it can go a little bit further before it goes away, this is predicted to be so, and it, that's not quite the problem but when that happens then the next place to go is Greenland and when Greenland melts away because of, 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 of the warmth that's when sea level rises will be a, a real problem. So greenhouse gases are the sort of things that 380 parts, 280 parts per million was when we were in pre-industrial times. 380 was around about 1990. It was high um, and then we've got a, a variety of things happening because 
we, we, we now include methane and some of these other uh, gases too to, uh, to contribute to the, the science of global warming. But it's not just gases. What we've found and what complicates the issue even more is, is something I sort of alluded to before, which is the effect of aerosols on climate change. Um, so it's complicated because sometimes they reflect the sunlight back and sometimes they absorb it, like I said, black carbon did. So um, things like volcanoes that give out sulfates are sort of reflective and produces haze that is reflective. Whereas uh, things like organic carbon, the soot, um, absorb the heat. So that balance between what's happening uh, it, it, it just depends on what you're throwing up in, into the air. And we give a name to when we're actually putting material in ourselves, the anthropogenic stuff, it's called the White House effect as opposed to the Greenhouse effect, and it, it, it consists of a number of possible contributions. One, of course, is that whatever particles you put up, you get solar dimming uh, because it can't get so much sunlight in, into the, onto the ground. Um, but uh, you do have this balance between reflection and absorption uh, that we, we really still find quite difficult to calculate. Other than, of course, now we do at least recognize that there is more than just greenhouse gases involved. Here's an example of how those aerosols did affect climate. Uh, 1815, a volcano threw up its sulfate particles. And one year later, remember, it takes that sort of time to, uh, to, to, to go around from hemisphere to hemisphere. Um, and it had one of the coldest winters ever. It was, on average, minus 3 degrees centigrade. Um, so th th this was noted after the sort of reflective ability of aerosols was in the atmosphere. And here, Danny, is a reason for your famine of 1740 is because in 1737, or it was in the last day of it actually, you had two volcanoes go up on the planet. One was over in Russia and one was of course Vesuvius as you know. And then uh, two years later we got the cold. The high cold, crops failed, died or emigrated, and so Ireland uh, had a problem. It wasn't alone though, because in, in England they had really cold, freezing cold winters too. So it is the phenomenon that you'd expect. It wasn't just singling out Kerry to be, uh, to be frozen uh, out of it, I suppose. What are we doing? Well, 2009, there was a good attempt. Uh, at least there was an idea of saying, we're going to get real problems if we go above 2 degrees centigrade on the planet. We're not going to really calculate, understand really what, what, what's, what's, go what's going on. Um, but they couldn't really get an agreement of, of how to do this, or even all the countries to sign up, particularly China and the United States. Um, but in Paris, this was just last year, the uh, 193 countries ad adopted this legally binding agreement. They don't know how they're going to do it, but they have at least all signed up to it, these 193, and, it, and the deal was signed on, on the 4th of November, but it's now been ratified, essentially, and uh, what they had to do to ratify that, it was called 55, 55, 55 countries needed to ratify it, and they had to account for 55% of the greenhouse gases, and as of two days ago, it was 100, Ireland, by the way, was 100th, in, in doing this, so it did finally manage to squeak through, and we've got 69% uh, percent of it um, uh, that, that, that's now accounted for. Um, you might want to talk afterwards, I don't know, about whether or not the Trump issue might uh, cause a problem to this, um, and I think that's a surprising answer, actually. So where are we, actually, with uh, this, this plus two degrees centigrade world? These are calculations done by DEFRA. It's the Defence Establishment in Britain. And what it shows here is if we've got 400 parts per million carbon dioxide, um, and we've got that now, there's a 50-50 chance of having an increase in temperature of about 1.7 degrees centigrade. If you go up to 450, there's a 50-50 chance of exceeding two degrees. And we're at 408, remember, so we're above 400. 
And if we carry on going four, four parts per million each year, then really only in three, four, five years will we be at a point where we've exceeded our two degrees centigrade, if we do absolutely nothing. And then, of course, other uh, amounts is a real problem um, of uh, increasing the temperature of three, four, five. And if that happens, I mean, with two, Greenland melting is, is, is likely. Um, environmental refugees at three, the ones I talked about before. Um, impacts, if it gets hotter, you know, this may happen anyway now. Global nuclear war, um, a plague and, and, and famine. Um, but at least on the right side, we have the Pope. The Pope uh, believes that there is a, 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 a real reason to believe in climate change and that something ought to be done about it. So, who cares about all this stuff as long as you've got your health? But air pollution means you haven't got your health because it has enormous numbers of consequences, some of which I mentioned before to do with respiration and heart and uh, nerve damage. Um, there's a variety of materials that do it. I, I mean, a whole set of things, organic compounds that I haven't talked about. Nitrogen oxide, soft oxide, ozone, particulate matter. And these can all move in and, and give us real problems. And I'm just going to pick out briefly just to, to show you why the, the, there is a health problem with particulates, small particulates, PM2.5. These are 2.5 microns large. You can get probably about 30 or 40 of them laying side by side in a human hair. So they're small and they can get down. And there was a, a very long study done a number of years ago that showed that if you were exposed to only five micrograms per meter cubed of, uh, over the, the, the seven year, eight year period uh, of, of particulate, then maybe a life expectancy of 80. Whereas if you had a lot more, let, let's say down here, over, oh, let's say 15 or so, then you've got a huge decrease in life expectancy because of that extra amount. Now, the amount that is, um, the amount that is uh, legislated, if you like, for currently is 15 micrograms per meter cubed. Um, and this soon will probably be moving down because of the World Health, Health Organization to about 10, where you don't get quite a large decrease in life expectancy uh, with, the, with the smaller amounts, but with, with the, the larger amounts you do. So this fired a starting gun about these very small particles coming into, uh, into our bodies uh, giving us uh, health problems. The health problems that they give, um, let's think about one of the real killers, the cardiovascular effect, is that if you have a normal artery, if you get normal blood flow, if you get one of these little nicks from the particles or a, a toxic sort of acidic material like NO2, um, it causes inflammation of, of, of some sort on an artery, which then, around which, plaque can build up. Plaque builds up, blocks the artery, stroke or, or whatever. The, the, this problem that's associated with air pollution um, driven a lot of people over the last five, ten years uh, of what to do. Um, I, I don't know what you have in your homes, but smoky coal and oil, gas, peat, wood, you may have any one or more than one of these. But if you look at the particulates that come out of it, you might be surprised to know that the smoky coal, which is 4.3, is exceeded by burning, burning peat and is certainly exceeded by burning wood. Um, gas is good and kerosene, I suppose, is all right. So there's a problem. So there's a, there was a project that John, um, is, is John Wenger, that is, 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 is still uh, coordinating, where we're looking at what is the contributions from peat, uh, wood, and, uh, and coal, and finding that in a, and this happens to be in Killarney, um, another couple of places have been done as well, Burr and Enniscorthy, uh, to show that there is large contributions of these other materials that are in the, in the air. You can work out by how much is sold of how much you think there should be, but measuring how much they're in the air is part of this thing called sapphire. 
particles are not the only thing. We're recognizing that, that nitrogen dark side is an important too. And um, it, it turns out that um, each year in London, nine and a half thousand people are killed by air, but more, 6,000 by NO2 uh, poisoning. So it's something we've really got to begin to look at properly. And over here, in, in this country, in the last year, you cannot have escaped things like Enver and causing problems to local health in Port Leash. The, the Volkswagen scandal of, of the nitrogen oxides and the fact that smoky coal might soon be banned in, in Ireland. I mean, the government fell, so we don't know what's happening next. Before you really can say, well, this is what to do, you've got to know how much there is. And most countries uh, monitor and report in real time, that is, people, the public know fairly quickly by these urban background stations and whatever, up to the apps and things, how much problems, how many particles, nitrogen dioxide, ozone, there is in the air. Um, and there, there you are, these are all the real time stations. Here they are, oh, yeah. Oh yeah, and you've seen Ireland that has one not working. <laughs> so um, there is a problem, and this is going to sound bad because it's not all bad, uh, because John and I were in a meeting only this week where we know in the strategic plan, and there's going to be a strategic plan, and Cork is a big part of it, is that now there, there may be 10, 15 uh, air monitoring stations, and certainly all over the country, to be able to contribute to the, um, the uh, international scene of how much pollution there is in Ireland. So what can we do? Oh, there we are. That's what we can do. We can grow some trees locally. That'd be something that would be useful in little clean air zones that we might end up having in the city. And what can you do? Well, I suggest you read this by Edmund Burke. I think it's, it, it is useful. Nobody made a greater mistake than he who did nothing, because he could only do a little. We can only all, generally speaking, do a little. But it may be a lot to other people who don't understand about air pollution and climate change. So you should go away, back, and try to convince people that they shouldn't burn fossil fuels. If you visit an American city, if you want to, Thank you.